Government Gay, Alex Reynolds series, book one. Writer, Fred Hunter, St. Martin's Press, New York, 1997. Narrator, Eric Arst. Dedicated for Joan Edwards, who told me so. Chapter four, getting a cab was a mistake. Threading through the cramped Saturday afternoon traffic around the park and then on Fullerton toward our house took much longer than it would have on foot. I had visions of our pursuer just strolling up alongside the cab and accompanying us home. But it didn't happen. Either we had really lost him due to my mother's well-honed ingenuity, or his partner was also keeping an eye on us and was still on our tail, or he simply didn't think it was worth his while to bother following us. Since he obviously already knew where we lived, none of these explanations thrilled me. In the cab, my heart was pounding, my purple gauze shirt was soaked with sweat, and I was finding it hard not to pant. Mother, on the other hand, was positively luminous. Her face glowed, and her smile was broad and clear. Lord, I'm hungry, she said. I turned my most incredulous look at her and said, How can you think of eating at a time like this? For heaven's sakes, what are we going to do? Well, I've been thinking about that, she said, and I could once again feel my heart sinking. We are going to have to sit down and go over step by step everything that happened when you were at the bar. I heaved a sigh. I've been over and over that. I told the story to Peter and you and Martin, and I'm sick of it. Mother curled her lip at me. I think if we're going to be followed around about like the centipedes in an old spy movie, we damn well better have another look at the circumstances. But, no buts, darling. I'll have you remember you're the one that got us into this. The cab driver was squinting at me from his pudding face in the rearview mirror as if he thought he might be called upon to testify about our conversation in a court of law and wanted to make sure he could identify me. I blew a kiss at him in the mirror and his eyes snapped back to the road. We don't even know what we're involved in, I said. Exactly, and as it seems to have gotten a tad dangerous, I think it's time we found out. The cab pulled up in front of our townhouse. I paid the driver, giving him an extra large tip, which I thought would make him feel like a sex object, and climbed out. Mother and I headed up the stairs. I pulled out my keys and unlocked the door and swung it open. We stopped cold in the doorway. Everything in the living room and dining room was thrown about. The chairs overturned, cushions tossed. This way and that, drawers pulled out of the antique sideboard in the dining area and an antique secretary in the living room. The contents dump haphazardly on the floor. We have a large entertainment center, one of those fake wood things that holds all your electronic equipment up against one wall of the room, and I was relieved to find that the television, VCR, and stereo equipment had not been smashed or thrown to the floor. However, our videotape library of close to 300 movies was scattered on the floor. We stepped slowly into the room in silent agreement that we should be as quiet as possible, straining to heal whether or not the perpetrator was still on the premises. We made our way through the living room and dining room and into the kitchen where we saw that the back door which opens into the breakfast nook had been clumsily broken open. I thought, so that's how he got in. Dredging up dialogue from the cop shows on television, we found something else interesting in the kitchen. The room had only been half ransacked. In the row of drawers stretching across the kitchen under the counter, the first few had been pulled out and clumped on the floor, but the rest were apparently untouched, as were the drawers in the china cabinet on the opposite side of the room. Oh my god, Alex, we've been so stupid. What do you mean? I asked, really perplexed. I didn't see how the hell we could have anticipated a break-in like this. Don't you see? Your friend, the clay person at the zoo, wasn't there to harm us. He was there to keep us under surveillance. I'll wager the minute he lost track of us, he called his accomplice here and told him to get out. It took a minute, but what she was saying actually did get through to me, and I went into the breakfast nook and sank into one of the chairs. God, I said, I don't think it was until that moment that the seriousness of our situation really hit me. I wonder, said my mother, her lips pursed and her brow furrowed as she surveyed the room. What? I wonder if they knew what they're looking for. What do you mean? She warmed to her idea. Well, it seems to me that the easiest thing in the world would be for them to kill us. I really don't need to hear this. 
Yes, you do. You see, they could kill us quietly and get us out of the way and then take all the time they needed to go through the house with a fine-toothed comb and find what they're looking for. While we rot. Oh, thank you, I said, wrinkling my nose, for that lovely visual image. Well, think of it. With me not holding a job and you freelancing, it might be a couple of weeks for anyone to notice that we're not up and about. You're really cheering me up to no end, you know? And you're forgetting about Peter. He's off tomorrow, but he works on Monday, so it would only be a day before somebody noticed we were missing. It suddenly dawned on me what I was saying. Oh, please, I don't believe we're discussing this. It would still give them a fair amount of time to search the house without fear of discovery, without resorting to the ridiculously skullduggery of watching for us to leave and then going through the place. Then why not just kill us? There's only one thing I can think of. She paused for effect, but the only effect she achieved was to irritate me. What? Perhaps they not only don't know what they're looking for, they don't know if it's a thing at all. What's that supposed to mean? Well, you said they asked you what that man in the bar said to you, and so did Mr. Martin. Maybe they can't kill us, or at least not you, because they think that man, Haycheck, may have passed the information to you verbally. I looked at her and noted the earnestness of her expression, and frankly, I had to admit, her reasoning was plausible. That's really great, I said. I feel safer already. Don't you think we should call somebody? This was an idea that managed to bring both of us up short. It would always have been my first instinct to call the police if anything like this happened, but now I wasn't sure. Who should we call, said Mother, haltingly. I don't know. Should we call the police, or call that Mr. Martin fellow? I don't know. Martin said to call him. He said to call if he remembered anything, not if we were ransacked, and I don't like the idea of him anyway. I don't trust him. That whole story of his sounds like a lot of rot. I don't like the idea of turning to him just yet. We fell silent for a moment. Well, I said cautiously, knowing how much she was going to love this idea. I know one way we can call the police in unofficially. What do you mean? said Mother, in a tone that clearly showed me she knew what I meant, but didn't want to. I mean, we could call Frank. For a moment, the ideal simply lay there like a broken egg, while Mother looked at me as if I'd sprouted horns. No, we couldn't. Of course we could, I said smoothly. He's a commander now, isn't he? Alex? She thought for a moment, then said, No, we couldn't. He was sweet on you, wasn't he? I gave that my best Earl Holloman in the Rainmaker delivery. Mother wasn't amused. I cannot call an old boyfriend and ask him to inspect my burgled home. For God's sake, it's not like asking him to give you a pap smear. I'm sure he'd understand. He might understand too much. What does that mean? He might think it's an excuse to start up with him again. Mother, I doubt if Frank is vain enough to believe that you would trash our entire house just to rekindle your romance with him. She took my face in his hands, which always smelled lightly of oil of Olay, and smiled as she shook her head. I do not need to further complicate my life. Darling, you and Peter are complication enough. I took her wrist gently, pulled her hands away from my face, and led her back into the living room, hoping that the sight of our splayed things would help her come to her senses. So, what's it going to be? I said. You don't want to call Martin, and I can tell you I agree with that one, and we don't know how much more trouble we might cause if we call them the police. What are we going to do? Sit here amidst the rubble and cry? Mother surveyed the room with an expression of her face that I can only describe as disgust and seemed to come to some sort of decision within herself. No. She said, heaving a sigh that almost leveled the furniture that had been left standing. You're right. I'll call Frank. Frank O'Neill was not on duty, but he was at home and available. He arrived less than twenty minutes after Mother called, which should have shown me there was some credence to my mother's fears that he was still carrying some kind of torch for her. The two of them had met when they took a night course in the greats of English literature at DeBall. Frank is the type of guy I'd like to think I'd go for if I were my mother's age. He's what I would call withered, handsome. His hair is gray with very little brown left in it. His forehead is permanently lined with frowning too often. His eyes look like they were once blue but have faded from seeing too much of the world. 
However, rather than making him seem old, this all lent him an air of sensual, world-weary knowledge. Mother opened the door and let him in, and when he bent to give her a kiss, she jutted a cheekbone in his direction. So pointedly, I thought she might puncture his lip, but he was too slick for her. He shifted his head slightly and kissed her on the lips. She took it graciously, but I noticed a certain sadness in her eyes. I think Frank noticed it too, because he suddenly broke away from her and came into the living room. Jeez, you weren't kidding. You were broken into. Hi, Alex. Hi, Frank, I said, shaking his hand and hoping that my eyes didn't look sad too. When did you discover this? Mother followed him into the room and said, A little over half an hour ago. So you haven't had time to find out if anything's missing? Not really. I checked on what little of value we have, and I didn't find anything missing. Frank was silent for a minute or so, picking his way carefully around the room and releasing an occasional, Hmm. Then he said, Yeah, your silver is thrown around, but not stolen, and then there's all this stuff still here. He waved a hand at the entertainment center. Yes, said Mother. Well, you know what this looks like to me? I suddenly felt that both Mother and I were afraid of what he was about to say. I blurted out, What? It looks to me as if whoever did this was looking for something specific. Neither of us responded, and after a tense little pause, Frank turned to me and said, What happened to your lip? Nothing, I said, looking down at the carpet. I'm not a good liar to begin with, so I can't believe I'm any better at it in front of a policeman. Whether or not he's boinked my mother, I ran into the bathroom door. Uh-huh, he said, making it clear that he didn't believe me. He turned to my mother and said, What's the second floor look like? Oh, I went up there after we called you. Whoever it was didn't get to the second floor and hasn't been touched. Hmm, said Frank, ruminating. You know, you may have surprised him. Oh, no, said my mother with a guilty glance at me. I'm sure we didn't surprise him. She means we didn't hear anyone when we got here. The glance had been mistaken enough. Frank had been a policeman too long not to notice the kind of look that passed between my mother and me. He dropped his hands to his sides and said, Jean, you want to tell me what's going on here? What do you mean? She fluttered when she said it. English women do not make good southern bells. I get the feeling that the two of you know something, like, who did this? Honestly, Frank, you know me better than think I'd know the type of person who goes around breaking into houses. I swear to God, I thought that any minute she would say, The calla lilies are in bloom. Frank let an ostentatious sigh and said, I know you well enough to know when you're not being straight with me. Sorry, Alex. Mother glanced at me, not so much for approval, but to let me know that she was going to go ahead anyway, and with an exasperated sigh launched into the story of the past 24 hours. Frankly, my gay toilet escapade had been repeated so many times by now, it was beginning to feel like an urban legend. However, Frank showed undue interest in the story, even though Mother was careful not to make any mention of James Martin's visit. Frank looked as if he sincerely doubted that his former flame was giving him the entire story. It sounds like you somehow got in the middle of a drug buy. I was astounded he had come up with the same idea I'd originally had. It was something of a relief, but of course, he didn't have all the facts. Do you really think so? I said. Yeah, it's possibly. Especially this business of following you and going through the house. They might have thought you got their drugs. Then he turned to Mother and said, You know, I don't like the idea of this. You could be in danger. Oh, said Mother, surveying the room. Oh, I don't think so. Surely by now they realize that they've made a mistake and they won't be back. She glanced at me again when she said this, and I could see that she was trying to convince herself more than Frank. Then she added half-heartedly, Besides, it could just be a coincidence, or being burgled now, just a coincidence. Frank narrowed his eyes and stared at her, taking one of those long pauses that let you know that you're not fooling anybody. When you already know you're not, well, that might be possible, but I think the drug story is better. His head swiveled in my direction and then back to my mother, and I suddenly found his choice of words unsettling. Unless, Frank said slowly, maybe you haven't told me everything? Mother gave a little laugh that would have been an embarrassment in their bad road company of maim. 
Why, no, of course not. We've told you everything, haven't we, dear? She nodded eagerly in my direction, and I piped in with, Oh, yeah, of course. Frank pursed his lips and made a little smacking noise, and said, Then why did you call me? Mother answered slowly, Well, I thought perhaps you might tell us what we should do about it. Put new locks on the doors, get a dog, but first you should report it. Mother and I both yelled, No! in unison, and we couldn't have made ourselves look more culpable if we tried. I immediately started an in-depth inspection of my two shoes, but I have to give Mother credit. Her eyes sparkled in their most playful way, and she smiled Frank right in the face when she said, We're a little nervy about this. You know, said Frank, looking more concerned and suspicious by the minute, I really don't like this. You seem to have gotten yourself involved in something one way or the other, and I think I'd better see what I can do. That's not necessary, Frank, said Mother, her smile remaining in place, but her sparkle getting a bit tarnished. He lowered his eyes and said, I'm worried about you. You know my feelings haven't exactly changed since I last saw you. Do you think you could excuse us for a moment, Alex? said Mother. I went into the kitchen and stayed by the door, not in an attempt to eavesdrop, but to be as close at hand as possible. Lest Mother's honor needed defending, really. But I couldn't hear anything they said. I didn't re-enter the living room until I heard the sounds of Frank being let out the front door. How much did you hear? said Mother with a coy smile. How much did I hear? I didn't hear anything. What kind of person do you think I am? She crossed her arms and her eyebrows arched in their centers. Their inside ends almost dripping down into her eyes. I don't know, Alex. Surely not the kind who would linger with his ear pressed against the kitchen door, the shadows of his big feet clearly evident beneath it. I don't have big feet. How much did you hear? I shuffled a little, but it really was all lost. I didn't hear anything. I was only trying to make sure that your honor survived the interview intact. My honor. My son is my business. What did happen? Just what I was afraid of, she said, sinking down into an easy chair. He thinks we can still re-spark our relationship. You could do worse. Alex, darling, it's unseemly for you to involve yourself in your mother's love life. She sighed and added, I think it was a mistake to call him all the way around. What do you mean? I told him I didn't want to report the break-in. I told him I didn't want him to do anything about it. But that doesn't mean he won't. Well, what can he do? I don't know, but I don't want him stumbling around in something that you've stumbled into. It could be dangerous. Worse yet, it could be dangerous for us if he makes these people think we've gone to the police. It was my turn to sigh. What do we do now? Call Mr. Martin? Mother stood, drawing herself up to a full height in her prison matron stance, looked me square in the eye and said, Not just yet. It's time you told me everything that happened last night, and I mean everything. With her in this frame of mind, it was useless to protest. She grilled me for the next forty minutes. I would have had more of a chance with the feds if I'd actually known anything. She stopped me at every other juncture to ask admired of questions, covering the small details of the larger information. I offered what the doughy man looked like. Who was standing near us when we spoke? Was I sure he hadn't given me anything? What was the exact words that the clay people used when they accosted me in the toilet? A scene that I had now repeated so many times it had taken out any surreal quality in my head, and I was no longer sure myself what had actually happened. She sank back into the easy chair and sighed. I don't see that this gets us any further along. We sat there in silence for a moment. I felt like I had a tornado in my head. When I couldn't stand the silence from my mother any more, I said, What do we do now? Mother surveyed the room, dejectedly glanced over her shoulder at me, and said, Clean! A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. 
reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.